How tall are you? Me? None of your business. I'm a little bit shorter <laughs> than Jen. I think it is my business. A little bit shorter than Jen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm 167. Jen, you are much taller in real life than I expected you to be. Like, when you showed up at the uh, yeah, she is train tall. station, I was like, whoa. Look at this giant. <laughs> I'm probably five, five, foot, five foot six. It's saying I'm five foot and then 5.748 inches, which is 5.479 feet. So that was, if you're 5.479 feet, you're really 5'6", five, yeah. 5'5 five and okay. a half-ish. Yeah. 5'6". That's pretty average. I think I'm very average. I thought you were like a little bit taller than that, Jen. <sighs> I might be. <laughs> Maybe I've grown. No, I think I'm about 5'8". You just seem like really tall. I think I'm quite tall for a British woman. Yeah, you are tall. Maybe that was it. I was just like so like used to seeing all the British people. <laughs> I literally look down on people all the time. I'm like, how, yeah. how are you so short? <laughs> oh, I was absolutely the tallest person around everywhere I went in London. I'll be a tall bit. Chris, you're a monster. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's alright. Hello, and welcome to the Bookcast Club, a podcast for people who love books. And today is probably one of the most special episodes we've ever recorded, and that's because we're going to be talking about my favorite books. Um, so let me just start off this podcast by um, saying you're welcome to my co-hosts for what I can only assume was probably the most pleasurable two weeks of reading they have had in years. So yeah, you guys are very welcome for that. Um, and I can't wait to talk to you about my favorite books, which are Wicked by Gregory Maguire and Self-Portrait with Boy by Rachel Lyon. Uh, but before we get to those, how about we talk a little bit about our currently or what we've been reading recently? How about we introduce ourselves? Oh, yeah. Let's introduce ourselves first. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, it doesn't matter who these people are or who I am. <laughs> All about me today. <laughs> All about me today, guys. Chris is in a very good mood. We have to tell people. I am in a really good mood. Chris, you genuinely brighten up my life, I have to say. Oh, stop it. <laughs> you make me laugh. You make me smile so much. <laughs> Jen's just trying to catch up for, because of the compliments that she I gave you off air. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's what it is. I'm doing it on air so that I look better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm Sarah. Hello. And I'm coming to you from the Netherlands. And I'm Jenny, coming from Norwich in the UK. Uh, what have we been reading, guys? Have you guys read anything? Oh, who, who are you, man with a dulcet voice? Oh, my name is Chris, and I'm coming from Indianapolis, Indiana. We've been talking for like an hour before we hit record, so it's absolute chaos here. <laughs> it's madness right now, unfortunately. We've just been covering Chris's recent dating escapades, and we're just we're excited. It's been a lot, but enough of that. Let's <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about what we've been reading. Have you guys read anything good, noteworthy? I can tell you what I've DNF'd. I DNF'd Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Spicy, spicy. Okay, why? I put it down to read Self-Portrait with Boy, and I didn't want to pick it back up again. So I haven't, and I've stopped. Even though it's 200 pages into it, I'm stopping. It's because Self-Portrait was so good. Oh, gosh, it made gosh. you realise <laughs> that other books couldn't compare. <laughs> um, which, I'm not surprised at all that this was the reaction you know i'm giving god chris is unbearable i'm giving you a double <laughs> thumbs up jen i approve this message that's excellent yes i always love to hear about dns yeah i found it very dense it's very dense and mm. overly dense for i as far as i was concerned no other reason than she wanted to put a lot of uh information <laughs> in there that i didn't need to know so yeah i was mm quite bored actually and 200 pages in and still be quite bored and i was like Ugh, i can't be bored with this and i put it down and yeah i don't want to pick it back up again so that's that one done and i do not need to read the second one even though it has one of the best covers i've ever seen that rabbit like i think it's carved is it carved out of wood it looks dead and skinned anyway fantastic cover. yeah it is sexy i'm on a bit of a non-fiction binge at the moment binge is too strong a word two books i've just finished unwell women by eleanor cleghorn um which i just reviewed in the news newsletter which i started months ago uh and it's taken me ages to get through but just because i was reading it um piece by piece so it's a it's a book basically about 
not the history of medicine quite, but it goes starting from the Middle Ages. It talks about how women have their symptoms ignored or like undervalued, and how this happens like very consistently throughout like all different cultures. Um, and how that's actually shaped medicine in a way. Uh, first of all, talking about how medicine was obsessed initially obsessed with how women were sort of there to reproduce and uh, be pregnant, and anything that might be wrong with them was sort of thought about in terms of how it would affect them being pregnant, whether they were pregnant, it, like that was the way that it was conceptualized, and then later moving into sort of like 20th century medicine because women do have, they present with like different diseases than men and their symptoms tend to be different and how, because the quote-unquote typical woman, the way that a uh, certain disease might present with her differs from a, uh, what a typical man might say, that makes them be systematically sort of undervalued or, or not their symptoms aren't taken seriously and often they'll have symptoms that are more psychological or emotional and these are consistently dismissed. And there was like really good examples of this starting in like the 40s, the 50s, the 60s which I found absolutely fascinating. And particularly what I found really interesting was there was a... The author sort of goes back over the kind of mid-20th century time period, sort of post the Second World War, and talks about a lot of what we would today describe as like mental health problems, which I found fascinating because you hear so much like n negative stuff from people saying, like, oh, these days everyone's got this and that and blah, 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 um, where she was like look, examining what people were actually saying to medical professionals in this time period and how it was just treated as like being... like It was just taken as nothing seriously. So it's it was really interesting... Um, um, I guess for me, someone who's interested in neuroscience, yeah, to see how, like, obviously there, there probably hasn't been a, a shift in, pre in prevalence rates like we think there has been. It's just that when women women in the 50s were saying, like, oh, I feel awful all the time and I have no motivation, motivation and I don't care if I live or die, they're like, oh, well, take a Valium and shut up, basically. And then, sorry, I may be talking for too long about this, but it was a fascinating book. And then it moved into contraception and how the whole development of the contraceptive pill happened and how much this question was framed around um, fertility and that kind of thing rather than like the comfort of women um, or the comfort of people who take who take contraception rather and how the dose was absolutely wild when it started and, and people who were taking it would have huge side effects but it wouldn't affect their fertility so it wasn't it took a long time for this to be adapted and it was also talking about how suboptimal the pill is as a thing and how it would be relatively easy to make a male contraceptive would be nowhere near as invasive as a as, a, as one that um, interferes with like uteral activity but this hasn't happened. And it was absolutely fucking fascinating. As you can tell by the fact that I've just garbled about it for five minutes. Hmm. Um, I absolutely loved it. Did you read it physically or did you do an audiobook? I read it I read it on my Kobo. So okay. I'm not sure how that fits into your system. <laughs> physically? Well, I was just curious if it was... Because I read a lot of nonfiction on audio. So I was... Just, and I know that you do too. Mm. So I was curious if it was on audio because I... I like that. Yeah, I think it would be a good... Uh, the reason I read it so slowly is that each, ch each chapter is completely self-contained and is about like okay. a quite isolated point in history. So I would just pick up it and read a chapter at a time sort of randomly, which was a great way to read it, honestly, because there's so much information. I will say that in terms of style styles in nonfiction, this does lean to the more academic side, um, which is my preference, but I know for some people... I've seen some reviews of people who say that it's dry, which would be a fair comment if you're if you're not into that kind of thing. So I, I personally mm -hmm. prefer it, but yeah, absolutely outstanding. Nice. Mm. The book I've read recently that's not, you know, the books I've reread for this uh, podcast episode uh, was Laurie Moore's Birds of America. So Laurie Moore's newest novel is entitled um, I Am Homeless If This Is Not My Home. And it's getting a lot of attention and buzz right now. But when it was announced, <laughs> I felt like a complete dingus because um, all of the uh, advertising for it was like, master storyteller, Lori Moore returns after a 10-year hiatus. You know, all these people acting like she was some, you know, genius. And I'm like, I have never heard of this woman ever you know what i mean like this like literary icon that like has completely flown under my radar um and i didn't want my first book by her to be this you know buzzy new novel i wanted to like kind of read her back you know log to see like what had earned her this reputation um and so i read birds of america which is her short story collection and she's much more prolific as a short story writer than a novelist and I really fucking liked it. I think that if you like people like Alice Munro or um, 
the collection How to Breathe Underwater or How to Swim Underwater um, by Julie Oringer. Um, that type of really grounded snapshots of people's lives with the kind of direct storytelling voice that really kind of cuts to the emotional heart of matters. Um, the characters in this collection were all older, kind of like middle-aged and above tackling things like grief, feeling adrift from their friends, you know, their careers, all this different stuff. Um, and it was just really incisive and funny um, and so beautifully written. The other thing I like is that I'm very picky when it comes to my short stories in that I really don't like super long stories. Like once we're hitting 50, 60 pages, I'm like, ah, we're done. Like, you know, I'm no longer, I don't want to read a story this long. Um, you could have just made it a novel <laughs> Or stories are like two, three pages. Like those, she writes like right in that middle, like 20 page mark that I really like. And I just really liked that collection. My favorite story in it was a story that was called, which is more than I can say about some people. And it was about a mother and daughter who were traveling in Ireland. Um, they are from the States and they were on a mission to see the, I think it's called the Blarney Stone. Is that what that's called, Jen? Um, and it's basically the stone where people go there, um, to kiss the stone. Um, and it's considered like good luck. The way she describes the stone and the way you have to get up to the stone and like, basically you have to lay backwards over a platform and put your head out over like all this open air. Like you could just fall right on through and like have all this trust and stuff. And you have to hang backwards and hold on to these rails and like kiss the stone. It's so horrifying and like cool and stress inducing. And yet all these people do it for this kind of very religious experience for the listeners who can't see Jen has pulled a picture of the Blarney stone for us and how you have to go in to kiss it. And it's, it was such an incredible story, like the way it was described um, and, and how these characters had to kind of build up their courage and do this. It, it just really got to me. Um, and I, I really, really loved that that book. It's books like that that I have a good description of something that's so physical can be yeah. so there's something about them. I can think of a couple of other books that I've read that have a very vivid physical scene like that. Um, and it just does something to me. Um, like I'm thinking of, for example, like John Krakauer's books about um like everest and people doing on these like mm. epic mountaineering things and it just makes me feel makes me feel something that makes me feel cold and that like makes me feel i as you're describing it i was like oh god great writing though what i was really impressed by was i've never seen the blarney stone never heard of it you know all this different stuff and i'm reading this description and i was like picturing it in my head of like how this was working out like the logistics of it which is actually quite complicated to like sit down and describe in words, mm. like how you have to get at the stone. And I was, I had this very clear vision in my mind of like how it was playing out. And then I went online and looked at pictures and saw videos of people casing the stone and it was identical. Like she really cool. captured it in, in the writing, which I thought was really impressive because it's, it is quite a physically awkward thing to describe how you have to get to the stone to kiss it. Yeah. They do have bars underneath them nowadays, which is nice to see. That kind of takes away from it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need the risk. <laughs> um, so that's what we've all just finished. Is that what we just talked about? I'm currently listening to another type of nonfiction. I'm listening to Somebody's Daughter by Ashley C. Ford, which is a memoir. Oh, which um, I own it. You own it. Ah, Belle was talking yeah, about I want to read it. when um, she came on to do an episode that I can't remember what the purpose of it was, but I remember her describing this to me. And I'm listening to the memoir, listening to it rather, which is written, good Lord, I'm listening to it, which is read by the author herself. Um, and it's a memoir about some about um, Ashley Ford, whose father was in prison for a long time. And it's about him being released from prison and the complexity of that relationship because he's essentially an absent figure and she doesn't know him. Um, and it's about him sort of like, coming back and being like hello everyone i'm here to play happy families really good i'm re really really enjoying it very good very good writing and the, it's very well read by the author i love memoirs read by the author it's just they they hit different as the kids say i really want to read that because ashley grew up in fort wayne indiana which is about two hours away from where i lived so really close. I went to Fort Wayne quite a bit. I still go to Fort Wayne sometimes. Um, and now she actually lives in Indianapolis. So mm -hmm. she and I live in the same city. And it's pretty rare for you know books written by Hoosiers to get the kind of buzz and acclaim that um, that one has gotten. So I'm really excited. Yeah. I, I'm getting dashed. I feel like we've had this conversation before. We probably have. And Bill loved it. 
it's opened up that book. I remember because I, when I bought it, the reason I like definitely bought it um, was I opened it up at the bookstore and read like the first page. And the first page was like a letter that yeah. her father was writing to Ashley from prison. And that letter was so uh, heartfelt and sad and earnest that I was just like, yeah, I have to read this book because like this is a, a, an incredibly brave thing to include in your memoir. I'm also listening to a memoir, a celebrity one. Um, so I don't get books from Audible anymore. I get them from Kobo. However, they did email me saying I could have three months for free. So I was like, oh, yeah, all nice. right then. But I couldn't get this book anywhere for ages on audio. And that is Talking As Fast As I Can by uh, Lauren, Lauren, Lauren Graham. I love this book. It's incredible. If people don't watch Gilmore Girls, they won't know who this is. That she is Lorelai Gilmore in Gilmore Girls. And I absolutely love her. For some reason, it must have been to do with the rights of the book. I've not been able to get it in the UK for years, so I was so excited when I went on um, Audible and they had it. It's just, I would love her. She's so funny, and if you like Gilmore Girls, you will love it. Honestly, it's it's perfect for Gilmore Girls fans, but also actually just hearing about her background in acting, and she very much came from an acting family. <laughs> she was an actor at a very young age, but she's just great fun, and I love it, and actually there's not that much behind the scenes so far certainly the main tv series because she admits to us she admits that she doesn't watch herself back so actually she her memories of Gilmore Girls are all kind of like blended into one um but yeah it's brilliant and I'm absolutely loving it it's everything I could have wanted and if you're a Gilmore Girls fan I definitely think you should read it it's such a good memoir. Like, it is such a good memoir. I read it, like, when it was released years and years ago, because I'm a huge Gilmore Girls fan. She has such vibes of, like, the auntie I wish I had. Like, the fun aunt that comes to the cookout and sits down and chats with you for, like, two hours. That's what reading this book feels like to me. And she does have a very in- quick way of talking that feels really, like, witty and like you're in on this really fun joke with her and it just kind of like carries you along through the memoir it's so good yeah it's very good it's really short as well because it's only like four yeah. and a half hours i think so it's a short book but yeah absolutely loving it yeah and hopefully fingers crossed if people are gilmore girls fans then we've got an episode coming up in the near future that might um satisfy a few people so yeah yeah can I ask, is it only four and a half hours because she's talking as fast as she She talking? does talk quite quickly. Even like, because I've only needed to turn this up to like <laughs> 1.2. In <laughs> Gilmore Girls, is very fast talking. I mean, that's yeah. that's the joke, isn't it, in the title? Well, but that is, she's so the same. So She's a bad actor, that's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> She just embodied that character so much. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It would have been very unsatisfying, actually, if I'd started listening to it and she was not like that. Mm. She was <laughs> boring and spoke really slowly. So, it's fine. <laughs> well, that show, I think, like, because it was basically they each episode's like 30 minutes but they actually wrote enough for like what would typically be a 45 minute script or whatever right and then they cram all that in so like the the actors had to speak that fast on the show which is incredible and like it really lends to the humor of the show that people like say these like zingy one-liners and like people just kind of move on like there's no real pause for laughter like you just gotta roll with the punches as it's going and i love that aspect of the show what am i currently reading i guess um i'm kind of between books right now um so i'm about to start open water i think it's called by uh, i need to look up this author's name yes it is by caleb azuma nelson and he has a new book out called small world i think his new one's called and it's kind of getting buzzy maybe book or talk um right now on social media and i saw this one at the bookstore and i figured hey i will try and read it and i read the first 30 pages of it and i was deeply impressed um by how well he was able to convey the loving tender and compassionate um feelings going on in this romance story um which i'm very eager to continue reading about so yeah i was very impressed with the language 
<laughs> Shall we do the ad break? Yeah, go on. Who's going to okay, do it? I shall. You're, you're going to do it. All right. He really is. I can do it. It doesn't matter. But um, if I'm going to do it, does Jen oh, mind yeah. sharing the... Uh, Don't you have the notes, babe? Script. No. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not prepared. Sorry. I'm the preparedness just... is not what I bring to this podcast, you know. I, I don't even, when I do the ad break, I'll be, I don't even read it. I just do do it off, off vibes. <laughs> vibes. Just vibe it. I do. Okay, lads. Patreon. We love it. Maybe I'll just do the ad break now. Pay, <laughs> look, pay, support us on Patreon, please. Um, message us on social media. We love it. Slide into our DMs. We are at Bookcast Club on both Instagram and Twitter. What else? We're also on TikTok. Oh, we're on threads now. Jen's just going mad. I don't even know what's going on. Oh. I need to be better about threads. Yeah, Chris is very poor at threads, but we're very excellent anymore. because Jen's in, in charge of our threads. I'm doing the ad. <laughs> we've got Sorry. It. I'm not with threads. This is where we pop a little ad break in to tell you about all the different ways you can support the podcast, most of which are totally free. A really effective and easy way of showing your support is by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. There is a link in the show notes that will take you straight to the Apple Podcasts page where you can write a review. If you listen on Spotify, you can also very easily give us a star rating. You can also share our posts on social media. We are at Bookcast Club on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can sign up to our free monthly newsletter on Substack, where we share even more recommendations, our pick of the new releases, and all the latest podcast news. But the best way for us to find new listeners is by you telling your book-loving friends and family about us. If you want to support the podcast financially, we do have a Patreon account. You can sign up for as little as £2 a month. We offer early access to the podcast, a close friends feed on Instagram, monthly bonus episodes, and our top tier will get you all of the above and personalized book remit recommendations we get you to fill in a survey and then we tailor our book recommendations to your preferences we will also send you books in the posts there are over 20 bonus bonus episodes you can get instant access to if you sign up as a patron today we now also offer a seven day free trial with our bonus tier the link is in our show notes but however you choose to show your support we as always want to say a huge thank you we appreciate each and every one of our listeners thanks chris and thanks to everyone who's been messaging us on Patreon lately. Actually, we've we've been yeah, having we've quite been a lot. Of, it. Yeah, it's been really. We've had quite a lot of Patreon um, interaction, quite a lot of Instagram interaction, which has been wicked. Especially like me coming into the podcast as somebody who had a YouTube channel and was very used to like kind of having direct audience feedback from the content I was putting out there. Like it's just like a standard operating thing. It was kind of weird, like coming onto the podcast where you would make an episode and then like you know, whatever response that might be to that episode could be weeks in the future or, you know, whatever, you know. And so it's been really nice having this kind of like active engagement and we really appreciate it. And it's really fun for us. So thank you. It's It's also, it's just fun to hear how people actually respond to stuff. Mm. Um, Yeah. And it helps us. Also, it helps us honestly, like understand what people like about the pod. Because it can be a bit weird if you're just doing different things. You're like, do people like this? Is this good? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for years, we could just tell that people were listening. (laughs) That was it. Yeah. But yeah, it's been really nice to talk to people. All right, so I chose two books as my favorites. Um, And when I was asked to pick my two favorite books, um, the first choice for me was absolutely obvious. There was no other book it could have been as my favorite, except for Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire, uh, which was written and published in 1995. I read it for the first time when I was 12 years old. I have reread it so many times over my life. Um, it never fails to amaze me. I think it's one of the most spectacular pieces of fiction. It is absolutely, in my opinion, the finest fantasy novel ever written. Um, and I think it's a joy. I, If you don't know what Wicked is about, then you know, maybe you've been living under a rock because the stage adaptation is so unbelievably popular. But I've never actually seen the stage musical. I understand that it's quite different in tone um, to Wicked, the novel. Um, But Wicked, it follows the Wicked Witch of the West, um, who is given the name Elphaba. Um, And it is a birth to death story. You follow her from the moment she is born until the moment she dies. Um, And you follow her as she um, grows up, goes to college, navigates the political landscape of Oz, and um, falls under the... um, was it suspicions or um, the 
she gets in the crosshairs of the wizard, um, who in this version of Oz is a tyrannical despot who arrived in the land shortly after Elphaba's birth, dethroned the the rightful rulers of Oz, um, and started instituting some very fascistic programs in Oz. And Elphaba is a resistance woman to the wizard, which marks her for assassination. And I just think it's glorious, and I love this book, and I would love to know what you two thought of it. But I'm very nervous because this book is actually quite unpopular, despite the fact that it's extremely good sales, and loads of people have read it. It actually has quite a low rating on Goodreads, and it does not hit for a lot of readers who I think kind of expect it to be more similar to the musical than it is. Now, Chris, you know I love you. (laughs) You know I really love you. (laughs) I didn't really like this. I'm so sorry. Boom. Yeah, boom, I know. Boom. I feel bad about Opinion it. Opinion discarded okay. in the trash. That's fine. I'll take it. I honestly found this a bit... Bo- I haven't finished it. I'm really struggling to get through oh, it. Oh, really? I've been reading this probably six weeks, and I'm really struggling to make good headway with it. Um, I'm finding it quite boring. I'll be honest. Mm, boom. I know. I'm so sorry. I understand what you're saying. I like, especially what you were saying about the writing style and that kind of thing. I see why you like it. For me personally, I don't know what that was supposed to mean. <laughs> Can you go? Listen, excuse me, Chris. You had your time. <laughs> I'm going to mute you. <laughs> it's time for my piece now. Um, I find it a little. Okay, first of all, I have to say I'm not. I'm not a retelling fan. I don't. I don't like retellings in general, and I don't. So the fact that it's in, it's a retelling of The Wizard of Oz. Um, I for some reason don't really like that as a premise. I don't really know why I don't like that, but I really don't like fairy tale retellings either. There's something about reading through something that I know the structure of already and having a frame in my mind that's quite specific about what the story is and then reading that reinterpretation. There's something about that that I really don't like. It might be because I think I have quite a strong imagination and when I'm reading a book, I tend to imagine things for myself quite very, very strongly. So when I'm imagining a character, I imagine them like really completely fully. Um, and I, I think my brain doesn't really enjoy having a structure already in its head, its head, it being my brain that I'm trying to sort of fit. It just doesn't like, as a reader, I I don't like it. So I, I can think of like many fairy tale retellings that I just don't enjoy the experience of. So the, so reading it, I, I didn't really like the, the weird fitting of it. I find it very unnatural. And then I just found it, to be honest, overall, overly detailed and a little boring. I'm really sorry. Yeah, that's the that's my main issues with it. I found it to be um very, very slow. What do you think, Chris? It's it's a very slow novel. Um I agree with that. I love the detail because I loved finding about finding out about his version of Oz. I love finding about out about the Vincus. I love finding out about um, Quadling Country. I love learning about all the different political stuff going on, Gillikin. The novel is so funny because I think it gets shelved in the literary fiction section most of the time, but it's actually, it's an epic fantasy novel is what it is. Um, but people don't really conceptualize it as an epic fantasy novel. They think of it, uh, it tends to be much more like just in the standard fiction section. With that kind of like epic fantasy structure, it has this entire secondary world it's building. Um, it's extremely detailed. I love all of that, though. Um, and I love the characters. I, I love learning about all of them. I love Alphaba. I think the thing that I find so impressive when I read the book now is how much I care for Alphaba, despite the fact that as I reread it and reread it and reread it, I discover more how little you actually get from her perspective in the book. It's a lot of people who are around Alphaba telling her story and their perceptions of Alphaba, um, but it's not really until towards the end of the book that you get like Alphaba's thoughts on everything. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Alphaba is a character... I think I'm yeah. I think I found the the way that she's treated. So Elphaba is the wicked witch, like the green witch. Mm-hmm. For people that don't know, I think I found the way that she's treated to be a little bit. It's so fairy tale like, right? Because it mm. is one. So it, it's so kind of like cut and dry, in terms of like she's green, they don't like her. But I just really didn't like the way that it. Yeah, it was just, there's so much detail well, about the world and what's happening in it. But then when it comes to Elphaba as a character and like this child, for example, when the child, when she's born, they're like, oh, it's weird. I, I just found that such, to be such an imbalance, which makes well, me feel, sorry, um, sorry, I know I'm talking over the top of you, which is what makes me, gives me that feeling of like it sort of being forced, the, the structure sort of being forced and it's sort of like being this story that's kind of like 
forced into this kind of existing. I'm making a lot of wild hand gestures. Um, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. What I will say, though, is I think that um, there are more reasons why people don't like her than just the fact that she's green. I mean, she's born underneath in the clock of the time dragon after um, her father has just been basically told off as this like evil figure and all the peasantry hate him now because of what the clock has told them. And she also comes, so there, there, like, yes, the greenness and marks her as this, but I think they would have probably hated yeah. her, <laughs> like at least in that village had she not been green um, from birth. But that kind of special mark of wickedness is, is given to her at birth. Mm, yeah, I know what you're saying. I guess I personally found it to be a bit a bit unbalanced in that way. But I also like when she goes to university. The book, the one thing that's very interesting about this book, I find, is that it's 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 a very mean spirited book. Like the dialogue is mean. Characters are really casually cruel to each other when you're reading the book, and you just kind of have to accept that, like this is how people talk to each other. Like their people are spiteful, they're rude, they're like really. They say awful things to each other throughout the entire book. And, and it really kind of like unsettles you when you first start to read the dialogue where you're like, God, like people are just like fucking awful. Um, but then you just kind of like get used to it in this way. It just seems to like kind of permeate the dialogue and stuff. It's just this like kind of sense of like this sharp tongue that everybody has, which I really love in the book. Um and I like the way you watch somebody like Elphaba have to navigate all of that because, like, I don't think that she's at, like more caustic or mean than other characters, and yet she's kind of constantly told off for it in ways that other yes, people are I not. Yes, I certainly agree. I actually, I mean, I'm not all the way through it yet, but I would actually find her to be less less mean so far, actually, than everyone else. Yeah. Okay, well, Jen, what are your thoughts? Um, right. So, what I was going to say is. I don't really know what the definitions of a retelling are because I didn't feel like this was a retelling of The Wizard of Oz because, and mm-hmm. I don't know, I haven't read The Wizard of Oz, but dedicated to the cause, I rewatched the film, which I do not like, and I rewatched it. And obviously, the witch is not Elphaba. She doesn't have a name in there. She's just a wicked witch, East West, which one is she? So I actually thought the him rewriting that side of it was really good for him to give Glinda and Alphaba and all the other characters that he gives backstory to. I was kind of amazed because the, even the world of Oz isn't well realised in the film. So the fact that he's done that, I was really impressed. However, I do have to say that I was bored at times. Um, and... I don't the I think I think this book warrants a reread and I think I I don't reread very often but I I'd like to reread it because I do feel like I struggled to take stuff in. I found his writing style quite difficult. I find his prose quite difficult and actually I thought well I'll listen to it on audio because then that'll be easier. And actually, it wasn't particularly, even having it narrated very well to me, I still struggled. And if I switched off for a millisecond, I didn't know what was going on. It is quite a dense, difficult book to read, actually. And I can see why, if somebody liked the musical and then they've picked up the book, (laughs) they're not going to like it. I liked the fact that it was much darker, much meaner, um, it's violent... Uh, it's sexually violent, you know. It's Alphaba's not a nice character. She's very sweet in the in the musical. You're supposed to like her. Um, whereas that's why I refuse to watch the musical. I, I'm going to go on a diatribe in a second, but go on. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? But yeah, I kind of disagree with the retelling side of it. But then I I don't know what what constitutes a retelling because I didn't feel like it was a retelling but then maybe that's my definition I don't know so he actually is retelling reimagining different things so the music or the music oh, sorry the movie with the wizard of oz is actually quite different from the book the wizard of oz and the wizard of oz had like a whole bunch of sequels and it was this long-standing series where l frank Baum had developed a whole bunch of different aspects of oz like the whole storyline of dorothy coming and killing the wicked witch was just one story in this huge series of oz 
So um, Gregory Maguire was actually a professor of children's literature. Um, he had done his whole PhD on children's literature. He was very fascinated by children's fantasy and he was living in London um, or no, he was living in the Midlands in England when um, two boys, they were like 12 and 13 years old, murdered a five-year-old child. Um, they kidnapped him from his mother and took him out on the town, played with him, gave him candy, and then just killed him and left him on the side of the road. And it was just really horrifying crime that happened in the Midlands in the 90s. And it got him thinking about evil and stuff. And he wanted to tackle evil from you know his perspective as this person that had studied a whole bunch of children's literature and so he started writing wicked um and writing um about l frank Baum's world and so he actually is retelling aspects from the movie and aspects from the books because for example like the tiktok creatures that are in um wicked are not in the wicked or are not in um, the wizard of oz but they are a part of like the general mythos of, of Oz. They are in Oz. Um, and the whole Ozma line, all that. So he's he's drawing from the L. Frank Baum stuff. But then there's stuff that he's specifically drawing from the movie. So in the Wicked Witch sorry, in the Wizard of Oz, the book, the witch is not green. That was a something they did just for the movie. So that aspect of it, which is a huge deal in Wicked, that her skin is green, is taken from from the movie um because he wanted to kind of like draw from the entire mythos of the wicked witch of the west our public perception of her completely not just you know in one particular adaptation of her story i refuse to watch the musical because i know that people you're supposed to like alphaba it's supposed to be she's not really wicked you've not heard her side of the story right and i think that if you come away (laughs) from this book thinking that Elphaba is not wicked. You have not read the same fucking book. She is, by the end of the book, she is truly a monster. Like, in every sense of the word. Like, vile. Even her thoughts can kill people. Like, she is a heinous woman by the end of the book. And yet, you understand her. And I think that's the point of the book. Not this horrible retelling of like no no she's really good she's misunderstood she's not she's fucking wicked she is evil like she is written intentionally to be monstrous sympathetic but monstrous and i love that aspect of the book yeah i've written it down in my notes that obviously it's very different to the musical which i have seen and i did enjoy a lot um but in a good way in a really good way um i love the musical but they change quite major plot points in it because tonally it is completely different. They generally follow the same story and I won't spoil it, but there are major plot lines in the book that wouldn't work in a happy stage production. So um, yeah, it's different in a good way. I think you'd still really like the musical as long as you went in and embraced that it's yeah. not I just, totally the same. I can't imagine I can't imagine the Elphaba of the novel standing up and singing Defying Gravity. Like it's no. so <laughs> far away from like what I have grown up, you know, I've grown up reading this book over and over and over again that I just can't bring myself to like stomach watching Elphaba singing Defying Gravity. Like it repulses me that someone took this story and like this character and did that. Like it's crazy to me. He likes the Gregory Maguire likes the musical though, so they are. Yeah, it actually it actually um makes total sense to me why you like it, Chris. Like, I hope that doesn't sound like an insult, but it. <laughs> no, I, I do. What you, I know what you mean. Yeah, knowing you as I was reading it, I was like, yeah, I can see that Chris likes this. Like, it's your kind of thing. Well, the other thing I was gonna say that I find impressive about it is how many different types of novel are in the book because. It's, it's split up into like four or five sections. And in the first section, it's very much like Elphaba coming of age, growing up, blah, blah, blah. And then like there's a huge time jump and then you go and you follow her like while she's in university at Shiz. You follow her, there's a huge part of the book. That's probably the, the longest portion of the book is her life in Shiz. And you follow her and the friendships she makes and all this different stuff in Shiz and how she starts to have like kind of radical inclinations. And then you follow her as she's living in the city and becomes... and. I don't even think this is that big of a 
uh, spoiler because I've seen it like described in the blurbs of this book before. Um, she becomes a part of a terrorist organization in the Emerald City that's fighting back against the wizard's programs against animals. And then in the final part of the book, so that, that feels like this kind of really exciting espionage plot. And then the final part of the novel is almost like a gothic novel where she's like kind of stuck in this castle and it's broody and dark and kind of claustrophobic and there's a bunch of really creepy things happening um, and she kind of has to settle in with the consequences of what has led her life to this castle i just love it i liked how she created the monkeys with the wings that are oh, obviously in yeah. the film they're just like sent out to do errands that are not in yeah. it very long but actually the book shows like her creation of them and yeah i did I, on the one hand i really did like it and on the other hand I did just find it a bit boring. And I just think that the narrator of the audiobook is really good. But for once, I feel like reading the physical book and really reading it, because I think you have to really take all of it in, is the better way to do it. Read it physically first and then listen to the audiobook. Because like I said, if I switched off for a second, I had no, I'd miss something major. And that's it, because it's quite a long book. It's it is I mean, yeah. it's a big book but for the amount that he packs in there it could almost have been longer because i feel like and i only really noticed this through, through listening to the audio is that something would happen in this the minute that i wasn't listening and it was a major plot point that then something would come along later on and i'd be like hold on a minute when did that happen so it almost like isn't long enough which sounds crazy but yeah just I did find it hard going. <laughs> Have you noticed, Chris, that these time windows that Jenny's saying she's switching off for are getting longer and longer? Initially she said millisecond. <laughs> now it's seconds. Five she minutes. said a minute. <laughs> for the hour that I didn't listen, I've missed a lot. <laughs> you are right, though. It is it is dense. There's a lot of small details happening. I mean, we've barely scratched the surface of this plot. Like, there's a lot of detail. And the stuff that, like, is at the very beginning of the book with the clock of the time dragon and the dwarf and the oracle and all this different stuff, like, you think, like, it's not going to add up to much because you kind of move on from it. There's a big time jump. She's going to university. Actually, all of those details are incredibly important and like all of these like little creepy kind of characters keep reappearing in the background driving certain events and the more you kind of like pay attention and reread the book you start to notice like how often somebody like yackle is in the background of this story pulling certain threads doing certain things and it makes you wonder how much control any of these characters have over their lives or if it's all just this clock maneuvering everybody. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't like it that much. Mm, it's okay, it's okay, because I have a feeling that the second book was the bigger hit for you guys. The second book we're going to talk about after our wicked discussion is "Self Portrait of a Boy" by Rachel Lyon. Which, when I was asked to pick a second book, um, I really could have picked a lot of second books. Like it was kind of difficult for me to choose a second book. But I decided to go with this one because I think it's extremely underrated. It came out in 2018. It was a debut novel. And um, yeah, just didn't get the kind of buzz and press that I think it deserves. But it's being made into a movie. And Rachel Lyon has a new book coming out next year. This novel is set in the 90s. It's following a young woman named Lou Reed, who has just recently graduated from art school as a photographer. Lou Ryle, sorry. Oh, did I say Lou Reed? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Lou Ryle. Lou is living in this like squatters block where like a whole bunch of artists have just basically taken over this apartment building um, and live there for extremely cheap rent. It's kind of running down and falling apart around them. And she's working a ton of jobs to basically make ends meet and to keep herself focused on her art. She has embarked on a program where she takes a self portrait every single day. Uh, just to keep up with her craft, you know, keep in practice. And when the novel opens up, she's taking self-portrait number 400, where she has set up a timer on her camera to um, capture her as she leaps in the air in front of her apartment window. And when she does this, what she doesn't realize is that her upstairs neighbor, their son, is falling to his death from the balcony because it was an unsafe balcony and he was playing up there. And when the photo develops... 
um, she can actually see the young boy in the background of the window falling to his death. And she realizes that this is the most significant artistic photograph she's ever taken, that it is her ticket into the lifestyle and the kind of serious credibility that she wants as an artist. It is the thing that will get her into this um, elite world of, of artists. And she is desperate to to make it. Um, and she has to grapple with the decision of whether or not she is going to show this photograph and at the same time she befriends the mother of this dead child um and it all becomes very complicated um so what did you guys think of this one i enjoyed this a lot however i'm not great with books about art and i'm Mm. sure we'll talk about this every now and again it verged into pretentious art speak and I can appreciate that actually a lot of that is to do with her character and she's supposed to be annoying. Like, you're not particularly supposed to Mm -hmm. like her. But I did want to tell her to shut up sometimes. (laughs) Which, it's one of those books I can really appreciate how good it is. But it did annoy me sometimes. Yeah, she's... She's also a character that's not likable. I mean, she is not likable at all. Um, which I love about this book. I love how kind of wretched she actually is and delusional. I liked her. Is there something wrong with me? You liked her? Yeah. I think there's a problem with you. I think she's awful. Well, we know that. I, th- I find her very sympathetic, actually, because she's so. She does a lot of things that are. I really like the book, actually. Sorry, it's just. Yeah, I really liked it. She does a lot of things that are kind of vile. But I understand why. Like, there's, I guess she's just an excellent character because there's nothing that she did where I was like, oh, what an awful thing to do. Like, she did do things that were awful, but I could, com- I completely understood why she did them. Um, and I really saw her as a product of her circumstance. Really, basically, so, so she's extremely poor. She's living in um, po- extreme, extreme poverty, I suppose. And so, basically, everything that she does. Not everything she does, but her a lot of her life and a lot of her decision making revolves around the fact she doesn't have any money. So she, she's working three jobs, for example. Um, and I found that her stress about finances, I thought, was really well written. Like, it's actually not mentioned that often, but it, it kind of is. But it's very subtle. Like, it's a thread throughout the book, and it made me feel stress as I was reading it. Like, and I was thinking about her um, when, like, someone would come to her door um, looking for a tip. I'd be like, oh god, well, how much money she got? Like, it's it was. The experience of be- living in that kind of poverty, where you're like dollar to dollar, not forget about paycheck to paycheck, paycheck, but like dollar to dollar, think- thinking about how much you have. I thought that was extremely well written, and yeah, th- therefore because that was so well done and so well developed, a-, a lot of her actions, which are a little repulsive, um, I yeah, not on, was wasn't on board with, but I found them very sympathetic. I definitely found her believable. Yeah, I agree with you that it's a bit like, I mean, the books are completely different, but a bit like normal people where you're just thinking, what if you just bloody talk to each other? With with her, you just think, just say something. Because mm. it, you know, it all, le- it all leads up to this event that you can see coming and you're kind of thinking she's not going to say anything the whole time and all the, <laughs> all the consequences fall from her decision not to tell the parents that she has taken this photograph and yeah i found it all entirely believable i didn't find her repulsive um and you're right i didn't she's just likable but not so when she um she shows this photograph she gets she pushes her way into like an art gallery doesn't she and those conversations are Mm -hmm. excruciating where she's phoning the art gallery trying to like speak to the owner and you're thinking oh please stop but i i got it she's like this pushy artist that completely believes her own hype like she's her own hype man because she wouldn't have gotten to where she gets to if she hadn't been um but yeah there's something likable about her there's her ambition is admirable there's like a part of you look okay, okay there's a part of this book that actually sums up my thoughts on this character like kind of completely which is that at the very end when she's done what she's done which by the way it's just obvious yeah. the, i feel like you can't spoil this book it's obvious what she's going to do from the very beginning um that she meets up years later with some of the people that um lived in this apartment complex with her 
And uh, one of them is this gay man that's really funny. And he sees her. (laughs) And he goes, he goes, she tries to talk to him and she hasn't seen him in years. And he kind of, and this is after she's become very successful off of this photograph. Um, And he kind of looks at her and he goes, oh, Lou, I respect you, but you're a bit of a cunt. And that's all he says to her. Yeah, I loved it. She like just basically has to walk away from the conversation because she doesn't even know like how to respond to it. But like he's right, like <laughs> that is the feeling you're left with at the end of this book is that like you respect her, but she's really awful. Yeah, I think she's compelling. That's the word that's come to mind. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that the way that all the other characters treat her is how you feel about her. Like they admire her and they admire her tenacity, but. <laughs> she, she's an asshole. <laughs> um, she have is. you seen the film? And actually, it was based on a memoir. Oh God, it's got uh, Melissa McCarthy in it, and she's—it's uh, the one where she's like f- forging the letters. Yes, and it's very similar at the end because she is inherently likable, but is doing very questionable awful things and she treats her friends awfully kind of by accident because she's putting her ambition first Mm -hmm. and it's very similar vibes so i'd say if you like this book or you'd like that film um then vice versa like give the other a go because she's very similar vibe wise there was a moment in this book that i think really summed up her as a character and it had nothing to do with the photograph or anything like that. And it's when um, her father, one of the kind of main drives um, driving this book, is that her father is very poor and he has to have cataract surgery. He lives a- far away from her. So uh, in the wintertime, she has to, she knows that in the wintertime, she has to go out and see him and take care of him during this cataract surgery. She goes out there, it's Christmas time. And, you know, he's very working class. You can tell he doesn't really understand what it is his daughter is about with her artwork you know and so but he wants to be supportive and so he buys her this photography book this like tabletop photography book this made me so sad he buys her this tabletop photography book and you know this old man has just had cataract surgery and instead of just being like thankful that he purchased something for her you know in her interests she like lectures at him about the fact that like this isn't art you know you you think this is art but this is not art this is not what i do this is a tabletop book this is commercial this is this is tripe like you know don't you understand the difference between what i'm doing i'm trying to capture the truth of humanity in my photographs and what you've purchased me and she's so mean to him (laughs) and he finally just says i don't care if you didn't like the book i just want you to be decent and she still lectures at him and he has to repeat at her, I just want you to be decent. And like, that's the feeling you have in this book while you're reading it is like, I just want you to be decent. <laughs> like, and it like never relents because it's just so awful what she's doing and how she like continues to push and the discomfort level you feel as a reader with it. It's just, yeah, it's oh. very tense as she does things like that, right? She's sort of pushing people in these extreme directions and you're like stop it stop it just stop it (laughs) please stop (laughs) i think we've all met people like her (laughs) at some point you know um maybe not people who are actually as talented as she is like you do get the sense that like she is talented she knows what she's talking about she does deserve to be um you know in these circles in in these galleries but God, she is just awful. It's a really interesting look, I think, at the kind of selfishness I think you have to have to make it in these circles. Yeah, because if she didn't act the way that she does, she wouldn't have got to where she gets. No. There's just no way. Exactly. Um, I actually have to say, I'm surprised that this book doesn't... I don't know why it's not more popular, honestly, because I feel like it fits in exactly with so many books. That have been big over the last, like, especially the last five years. I know. When did it come out? 2018. Because I couldn't get hold of it in the UK. I don't think it was ever published in the UK. Oh, that'd be why. <laughs> um, I was going to say, apart from, aside from her character, and we all know that I, I love um, a setting as a character, but I, I loved New York in it, and I loved her 
do we call it artist re- residency? I don't know. They're basically squatting in this building, aren't they? But they're all artists. Even that was really well, well realised so for it to be such a good character study and then for where they're living to be so well realised as well. And also the friendships that she forges within the apartment building reminded me a little bit of black butterflies like she's kind of forced into these friendships because uh, they're, they're going to be kicked out of these apartments aren't they so she becomes like a member of the committee that are discussing <laughs> discussing um these issues i i like that element of it as well these like friendships that she's forging and the friendship that she builds with Kate, who is the mother of the child that's died. It was it's just a very clever book that underneath all that you've just got this dark secret that she's keeping whilst developing like genuine friendships that you know she's just going to you know, throw it out the window to get to where she wants to get to artistically. Oh, that friendship she has with the mother is so tense and good because like you as the reader are aware of what she's doing and yet that friendship is so tender and like this woman is able to confide in Lou in a way that's that like she can't confide in other people even to her own husband about the grief she is experiencing all while you know that Lou is about to like stab her in the back in the most unbelievable way possible and like you're just watching this friendship knowing it's coming it's awful I've got an interesting point to make, and that is that I, for some reason, I don't, well, we know why, but for some reason I read this as being a suicide, and it was literally only when you said at the beginning, that's why I picked up my copy, I went and got my copy of the book, because you were like, oh, he falls off the balcony, and I was like, no, he jumps, and I just reread the the first chapter as you were talking, and you're right. So I read this whole book thinking it was a suicide. That makes it even more upsetting. I think the only thing that really deciphers it not being suicide is because when she gets the photo blown up in detail she can see that his like laces are undone in the picture i don't know if it's like explicitly said that he something to do with railings as well because the railings get replaced at one point so his like laces are undone and the railings been replaced um by the committee that gets yeah, stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> there was something about the way that described him falling in that first pass of the description of the photo that made mm. me think that he jumps. And so then I just thought about it. Uh like it's just that's just how it was in my head. I wasn't sure for it for a while, definitely. I never thought that it was a suicide, but I don't think it's like a totally incorrect reading of it either i don't think it but i think it said that he had been like up there he was like a really rambunctious child Mm. like a not a particularly easy child to like when he was alive um which is something that the mother kind of opens up about to lou is the fact that like in, in some ways yeah he was so difficult that like she felt almost this horrid sense of relief when he died and then this horrid sense of guilt for feeling the relief and all that gets explored really beautifully in the book. The only thing that I wasn't sure about, other than not liking her and finding her annoying, um, <laughs> was, well, I don't, this isn't a spoiler, I don't think, because she thinks or believes she's being haunted by him. Mm-hmm. That was the only bit I wasn't sure about, which then the the very end of the book... I don't know. I just didn't quite work for me. So I don't know how you two felt. Interesting. I think that she was using his haunting as an excuse to justify what she's doing. So like towards the end of the book, see the thing is, it's really interesting with this book is that she's so deluded and like self-absorbed that when she's and the book is written in first person, That when she's describing her motivations on the page without actually speaking them aloud to another character, you can almost believe the righteousness of what she wants to do and that she feels like what she wants to do is righteous until she's like forced to speak the motivations aloud to another person. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like the once the it's said aloud, it's like the magic is the magic spell dissipates and you realize like, no, like you're just an awful person. Um, 
and that's how I felt with the ghost storyline. It was haunting her, but she was using that haunting to like kind of drive her her own ambition of what she wanted to do. And she like tries to tell the woman that runs the gallery like he wants it, you know. <laughs> and he realized like she she doesn't really yeah, she doesn't even really buy her own her own shit, you know. I also read it as being part of her taking on more of a work and becoming more and more sleep deprived sleep deprived because the less she sleeps the more she hallucinates. Yeah, she's very sleep deprived, isn't she? It'll be interesting when the film comes out how they handle the ghost aspect because I'm assuming it's going to be a little bit more played up in the movie and be a little bit more thrillery. I reckon that they are going to remove the ghost. And maybe it would be in her imagination only, I would say. Cuz they'll take out I reckon they'll take out that supernatural element of it. Because it's it can be very tense. It's gonna it, you can make a really tense psychological thriller out of this. I would say. Do you know what vibes I'm hoping the movie has? Tar. Oh, I haven't. Still haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen, seen it either. That. You haven't seen Tar yet? Oh, I thought you'd seen it. Oh, it's really good. But Tar actually has a lot of similarities as a film, and Lydia Tar is also experiencing some kind of haunting in that movie that's very psychological and you're not sure like how much of it you, you've seen Tar, right? No, no, I haven't, but I know what you mean. Oh, okay. Um, I just said I hadn't, Chris. So excuse me. Oh, sorry. I can't hear Don't very well. Listen. <laughs> We're both like, no. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen it. Oh god. Um but yeah, I'll be eager when the movie comes out. Well I'm glad at least one of these books was a <laughs> success. Yeah, I'm sorry about Wicked Chris. That's oh, okay. I kind of knew that that one was going to hit weird because it hits weird for everybody. I had a thought, one last thought, which you can totally cut when you're editing, but I just wanted to say it to you too. The thing I really love about Wicked <laughs> is... <laughs> You've got to leave this in. There is... <laughs> there is a type of fantasy novel that I feel like is allowed to be written in England that never gets published or like american fantasy authors are not doing and gregory Maguire, i feel like captured that vibe in this so i'm thinking things like um philip pullman's novels i'm thinking things like Susanna clark things that have this like fantasy vibe and yet also kind of like literary credibility and historical like there's there's a certain vibe when i'm reading them that like i don't get a lot from american authors except for gregory Maguire, which incidentally he wrote this book while he was living in england and teaching over there so like unsurprising that it feels like it has a very like british um tradition is it tedium tedium <laughs> yeah <laughs> and on that note <laughs> is that what you're describing chris <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Describing excitement of the highest order. Well, yeah. I mean, we just full of Pullman. Susanna Clark. I was like, oh, yeah, let's see what the theme is. <laughs> you don't like you don't like Philip Pullman or Susanna, uh, Susanna Clark? Clark? No. I mean, as a as a person, I she's fine, but uh, I don't like her books. So Philip, I've oh, I mean, I read I read Philip Pullman's books um, way too late. Like I read them as an adult. I did too, and I still liked them though. Oh, okay. Well, that was I was trying to give myself an out then. <laughs> I didn't like them, no, but I they just didn't didn't do anything for me, honestly. Even the idea of having a little muse or whatever those animals are called didn't sit well with me. Yeah, I didn't vibe with that. I mean, th- we've really parted ways here today, Chris. We have, yeah. There's only room for one of us on this podcast. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to f- fight to the death over it or something. We'll figure it out. Happy Pride Month, everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you guys very much for listening to this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and if you have read either Wicked or um, Self Portrait with, with Boy, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, if you want to connect with us with questions, ideas, feedback, anything, you can reach out to us at email. We are at the Bookcast Club at Outlook.com. We are on Instagram, Twitter, all the socials at bookcast club you can sign up to our substack letter newsletter for more reviews new releases podcast recommendations updates and uh don't forget to check out the patreon if you want to support us financially we've got a seven day free trial going on so we would love to see more of you guys um yeah thank you guys very much for listening and for hearing me waffle for an extremely long time about books thanks chris well done chris goodbye bye